Government at the speed of business is not just a marketing slogan. It is our operating principle at the bank, and it applies to every single area of our bank. We are more and more customer focused. We are trying to find better ways to meet your needs as exporters. And that customer focus, because we want to do our part to double exports and transform the American economy. Now, I'll be talking a little bit more at lunch, but not to keep you on the edge of your seat, exports are up 17% in the first year, in 2010 over 2009. So we are well on our way to meeting the President's goal. And in January of this year, we had the largest single month of exports ever. The largest month ever for goods, services, and commodities. Let's give that a round of applause. And the year that just ended in September was a record-breaking year for Exim Bank, and we're looking forward to repeating that this year. I hope this conference keeps up the momentum. We have a great lineup of speakers, and you're going to hear from leading executives, you're going to hear from academics, government officials, about the state of global business and the global economy. We're going to lay out some opportunities, some challenges, facing companies doing business around the world. We're going to also talk about some new financial tools and programs to make accessing these markets and to help you become even more competitive. You're going to have a chance to meet men and women who are running these companies, who are looking to sell overseas and looking to buy your products. And we are selling, and the comp companies that are here sell everything from surgical sutures to solar cells. And in this way, we can, as the President has said, win the future. To do this, we have also rolling out <clears throat> a number of financial products and programs, such as our global access for small business. And I've had a chance to travel the country on a number of these global access events already. In fact, <clears throat> I spent the first week of February in both New Hampshire and Iowa. And you thought only Republican candidates would trudged through the snows of Iowa and New Hampshire in the first month of February. Well, this Democrat was there too. And what I was doing, I was trying to build more awareness and to help more companies export to more places and sell to more customers. So our goals at XM are concrete and they're tangible. So you're gonna hear in a few minutes from a few CEOs who are gonna talk about um, they are large companies and how they uh, manage the global marketplace. We then have another panel I've titled kind of Small No More. These are companies that were once small, but through exporting are now larger companies. In many cases, they actually don't even qualify as a small business anymore. We're going to then have a conversation with Jim McNerney, who is president, and he's chairman of the President's Export Council. Then we'll have lunch. Then I will give you an update on the bank, where we're going, and then in the afternoon there will be a number of breakout sessions that will um, give you more in-depth and a deeper dive into some of the details. So our first panel, and not to waste any time, is going to be uh, led and moderated by Michael Froman, a friend I, uh, we met in New York when we were both uh, working at the New School. Uh, I was, we were both trustees. I then actually became a dean, so Mike sort of became my boss as a trustee. Mike is a Deputy Assistant to the President and is really at the fulcrum. Most importantly, Michael is at the fulcrum between the National Economic Council and the National Security Council. And issues around trade very much hinge on work of the National Security Council and the National Economic Council. So I can really think of no better person to lead this conversation that we're going to open this morning with. Uh, Michael will be joined by uh, Peter Loescher of Siemens, who is the Chairman of Siemens Worldwide uh, by Doug Oberhelman of Caterpillar, who I had a chance to meet when I visited Caterpillar in Peoria um, early last August, and Dave Cody, who is the chairman of Honeywell, who I've had a chance to work with, particularly in his work with India and also uh, in other ways that he's contributed to the government. So please let me join me in welcoming this panel and let me bring them right to the stage. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Fred. I must say, I never thought of myself as Fred's boss. And uh, it's a great tribute to, to Fred that all of you are here. And what he's done with Exim is really quite remarkable. I have to say, if our goal is to double exports over five years, and if this conference and the participation in this conference is any leading indicator, I think we're in, we're in quite good shape. So welcome to, uh, to all of you. Uh, let me start. You have three of the world's leading CEOs here, and the CEOs of some of the leading companies and leading exporters, really global companies who have uh, made their name and, and made their success on the basis of understanding the global economy uh, intimately. Let me start with a softball question uh, for each of them. It'll get harder over time, don't worry. But to just to warm them up, if you could each define for me what you think are the critical elements of competitiveness. Doug? Uh, pretty simple. Uh, management talent you have in your company, product quality, and how you get it around the world or wherever it is you're, you're, uh, you're exporting to or selling to. Uh, we spend a lot of time on our management team and training and development, of course, product development, first class quality, and then how do we get in front of customers every single day to make sure that they win with our products ahead of everybody else. It's a, it's a symphony almost of things that have to happen, including help from governments, because there are other governments that are competing against you and against us, and it all comes together, and it's all part of this big competitiveness uh, definition. And let me, let me ask, just to, to broaden that before we turn to Dave, on <clears throat> a competitiveness policy and what, what countries can do to make sure that they are competitive environments for your company, what do you think that they should be focused on? Well, what we have found internally, and, and we're, we're trying to change inside our company right now, in, in many ways, you're comparing year over year advancement. So at Caterpillar, we've looked at last year, we like to make a plan that is better than last year's and so on. But if that is not good enough to be your competitor, and our competitors are mostly non-US, Japan, Korea, uh, Scandinavia, and some Chinese now. If our plan isn't better than theirs, we lose. It's no different than in America. If American policies for competitiveness for its country, for its businesses, for its people, isn't better than Japan, Germany, Korea, whoever it is, we lose. So you really have to aim the guns out no matter where you are, whether it's government, private business, or whatever institution it is, your school for that matter, and really look at your competitor and beat them. Because if not, they're gonna beat you. Dave? Actually, Mike, I like the way you broadened the, the question, because I do think that that uh, needs to be addressed at two levels, a country level and a company level. Uh, on the country level, I'd say this is one where I actually fear for my own country, because the global economy has expanded from what used to be a billion people to now three billion people, and we still seem to want to act like it's still a billion people. And the way I've talked about it is, it's almost like we'd rather brag about winning the Olympics 40 years ago than training hard to win the Olympics this year. And I look at just three big ones that I think need to get done in the US. We need to address the debt, we need to have an energy policy, and we need to have an education system that reinforces math and science and allows people to focus on technical skills even in high school. And that's one where I've always thought the German model was actually quite good with their apprentice system. I'd like to see more competitiveness in the US, less entitlement, more of a feeling like you've got to earn your way every day, and recognize that the global economy has expanded three or four times the size it did before in terms of the people competing. On a company basis, it's the same thing, <clears throat> just at more of a micro level, and I'd reinforce uh, what I believe Doug's point was on productivity, that you, you always have to be able to do more with less every single year. You have to find a greater way to add value than your competition that you did the prior year. And that concept of productivity is, I just think, a huge idea that frequently gets lost. And it means creative destruction happens, old industries get destroyed, the new ones come in, the whole Joseph Shump Peter thing. And we need to be more encouraging of that dynamic within our companies and within the, within the country. Peter, in addition to answering this question, could you maybe pick up on Dave's point? The German model is one that people around the world look to with great admiration in terms of its uh, competitiveness. You're a high-wage country. Uh, Germany's a high-wage country, uh, uh, high benefits, and yet you manage to compete globally in a manufacturing sector uh, with the likes of, of China and, and elsewhere uh, without as much outsourcing as, 
as many U.S. companies do here. What do you think is the key to the German model? And what aspects are particularly German, and what aspects do you think places like the United States might be able to adopt themselves? I think what particularly this crisis has, uh, has dem uh, demonstrated that real engineering is more important than just financial engineering. <laughs> and, uh, That's pretty good. <laughs> That's it. And I think if you, if you look back and you compare different environments, you, for example, when you talk about Germany, I mean, there's a, there's a real engineering culture as part of the overall fabric. So the industrial base, in terms of the importance to the country, in terms of industrial policy, in terms of innovation leadership, quality, productivity, when you compare, for example, in Europe over the last decade, just labor productivity and compare it with different countries, you would realize that actually also from a productivity standpoint and innovation leadership, uh, there was great improvement happening and as the world economy is picking up, and particularly in the emerging markets, you have to have a product portfolio uh, and uh, solutions which are really tailored to the market needs around the world so that you have strong export leadership in terms of not just at the, at the large company. I mean, we are operating, Siemens is operating in 190 countries of the world. But you also have small and medium-sized companies who, who went very early on international and they have very strong global platforms. And the integrated supply chain aspect between large and small companies in terms of having a real fabric of an industrial fabric and tie it back with research institution. But it goes back to what Dave was saying, actually. I think you need to inspire the young generation that actually the next Sputnik is something which will very closely be tailored towards the engineering brownness and uh, the opportunity space, which it, uh, which it is. And this is actually how it is recognized within a culture. And that's the great, and this country was always fantastic in terms of how it was driving innovation and turn it into product success. And this is the fabric of, of the United States, and this is why we are such a strong believer, and we are continuing to invest in this country. We have invested 25 billion over the last decade, and this is why we also now putting into, continues to put research and development operations and also manufacturing to export more than two billion out of the United States and use it as an export platform. Well, let me, let me, if, I, I, if I could just, yeah, yeah. pardon me, I want to uh, play off a couple <laughs> That's of points. Don't here. fight, guys. Sorry, Mike. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> you know, you're not going to get a chance. Back to the point of training for future Olympics and thinking we can win. This is an American comment here. 95% of the world's customers are outside this country. Mm. We act far too much as if that's not the case. We are 5% of the world's customers on the globe today. And there's a huge growing bunch of customers out there that want things that we do, make, and, and can get after. And that's why our country policies have to be smooth and quick and seamless and, and a, with a winning attitude, as does, does do our companies as well, to, to go after those consumers. It's a tremendous opportunity, unprecedented, mm -hmm. and certainly in our lifetime and maybe the, the history of our country, but we've got to change to adapt to that. I want to, I want to come back to that, but let me, let me if let I could, I'd, like, I'd like to uh, expand on Peter's point on uh, engineering. I mean, I've said many times as a country, it seems we'd rather graduate lawyers than engineers. <laughs> no offense to the lawyers in the crowd. I, you could tell I'm not one. But, I, but I'm not an engineer, I no, nor, nor is he, <laughs> be careful. <laughs> nor is he a diplomat, by the way. Mike's <laughs> cringing. <laughs> But at the end of the day, innovation comes from engineers generally. And if we just take a look at number of engineers, we are always concerned about China. Every press report you read, everybody's worried about China. But if we take a look at it, uh, a couple of years ago, and this is data that we got through uh, the Fiscal Commission, the U.S. graduated about 450,000 engineers. China graduated about 950,000 engineers. And that's with only having a third as many college eligible kids going on to school. When they achieve that same level, they're going to be graduating 3 million engineers a year versus our 450,000. It is going to be tough to compete if we still think that we can be uh, graduating liberal arts folks when they're graduating engineers and be able to compete. We need to have a much smarter policy, I think, when it comes to math and science reinforcement at the high school level, apprenticeship programs, uh, engineering or STEM, however you want to call it when it comes to college. 
But we can't think we're going to innovate without engineers. It's not going to happen. Well, you, you both opened up a number of different avenues <laughs> we could go, but let me, let me go back. We could spend all day uh, on education. Yeah, uh -huh. let, let me go back to, to something Peter said. Uh, you, your companies, like, like many companies, have been extremely successful over the last few years. You have a lot of cash that you built up. Uh, we're coming out of a global recession. How are you making your decisions of where to deploy that cash, where to invest, where to create jobs, and what is the gating factor for whether you're putting those investments in the United States as an export platform or putting them somewhere else? Doug? Well, uh, for us at Caterpillar, we've doubled our capital expense in 2011, have a $3 billion expense this year, which has doubled the amount we've ever done in the past, half of that in the U.S., half of that outside the U.S., and a good piece of that outside the U.S. in growing markets. Developing economies are growing double developed economies and starting from a lower base. So for us, which is a big play on infrastructure, on mining, on transportation, on power generation, that nine, those 95 percent of consumers out there outside the U.S. are where it's going to be. But there's still a good market here, and we export a lot from the United States. We exported $13.5 billion last year, up $3 billion over the year before, and Fred, we're contributing to that number in a big way, and we'll look to that another big increase in 2011. So we need the U.S. investment as, as a base for our R&D, a base for engineering talent, as Dave's talking about, but that spreads across the world as we go, and then we just need physical presence in places like China and India and Brazil, where there's just infrastructure budding in our case everywhere. Can, can I, before I turn to the others, can I ask you just to expand on that last point? Because uh, certainly the, the issue of, of outsourcing, moving production abroad, remains a politically uh, very salient issue here uh, in the United States. And uh, how do you see that balance between being yeah. in your markets, being yeah. in Brazil and India, in, in our and case, being here? In our case, all of our China factories, all of our China business stays in China. We export virtually nothing out of China. We are a net exporter from the U.S. to China, hundreds of millions of dollars, and that's going to continue. Our biggest equipment that we make is today built in the U.S., and we export all over the world. All of our investments in China stay in China. We have almost 8,000 people in China already, and that's for the China market, supported by lots of jobs, lots of research, lots of engineering right here in the U.S. So we're a little bit different and we're very much pro-investment in developing countries because it's good for American workers. Dave, you want to come on that? Well, I'd say uh, because of a, as my friends up in New Hampshire would still say, because of a wicked silly repatriation policy, what's happened with Honeywell and is true of many U.S. companies, uh, there's cash and debt on the balance sheet and you would see the cash is all outside the U.S. and almost all the debt is inside the U.S. and it's it's done for silly reasons. We're the only major economic country that has this repatriation policy. Again, if you were to look at Germany and France, they're allowed to bring back 95% of their earnings without any additional domestic tax of any kind. So that creates this environment that says, well, if you're going to invest, you should invest the money where it's, not gonna, where it's gonna be the most tax effective. So we end up with this very silly policy. It helps to drive interest rates up in the US and makes absolutely no sense. When we look at where are we going to invest, I'd like to reinforce uh, Doug's point, is you have to invest where your markets are. If people are buying things in China, you don't say, now is the time to put an investment in Florida. And I like Florida, but that's not where you think of if that's where your market is. You're going to tend to invest where your markets are, where the economy is growing. But as a result of that, for no nefarious reasons whatsoever, your earnings and cash end up in those places because that's where you're doing business. And if we're going to be competitive as a country and we want our major companies to be competitive, they have to be located in those countries. You, you have to be there. But Dave, what does that mean for the U.S. as an export platform and as having a manufacturing sector in the future? If the U.S. is growing so slowly compared to the <clears throat> rest of the world, particularly the emerging economies, how do you see, how is Honeywell deciding where, what jobs back here might be supported or invested in because of the expansion in the emerging markets? Well, I'd go back to the beginning on that question, and that's one where we need to start thinking about made as a, in America as not an entitlement, and if it's not being made in America, somebody's doing something wrong or nefarious again. 
<clears throat> but rather you have to produce where you are going to be the most productive. And I think you heard Peter say the same thing about if you go to Germany, the whole country is focused on how do you produce things with less labor, be more productive, and get better and better at it every year. That's the focus that we need to have as a country, is how do we become so productive that when you're looking at where to produce something, you say, well, of course you produce in the US. <clears throat> you want a simple example that would be impossible for, I think, the American public or the newspapers to stand, is that the corporate tax rate should be zero. We argue about whether it should be 25, 35, it should be zero. If you wanted to attract an incredible amount of foreign direct investment, people investing in the US, you make the tax rate zero. You would get an influx of capital like you wouldn't believe. Look, look at Switzerland. So, Switzerland, Singapore, 9% tax rates, and they are drawing all kinds of investment of all different shapes and sizes all through Asia and, and Europe yep. to some degree as a result of that. Yep. It, draws, it draws FDI, no question about it. And your productivity comes from your companies. Standard of living, productivity, jobs, it comes from your private companies. Peter, how are you making decisions about where to deploy your capital? I think, I mean, uh, I, I just add what Dave just said. I think the most important thing is you add where, where your markets are, where your customer base is. So you have a very solid look in terms of how you anticipate over a longer period of time growth rates happening in different parts of the world. I mean, my company is 80% of, of our sales are global sales. Uh, so we have a third of our global business in the, uh, in the emerging economies and we have 25% here in the United States. So the first thing is that you say, where's customer proximity? The second is, is then that you then have actually because of the global nature and the, and the speed of change which is now happening around the world and that all economies and countries want to re-industrialize. I mean, the industrialization agenda is now at the forefront of many, many governments around the world. So you have to build very intelligent global networks. And I give you a great example why we have decided for the United States, for example. We have just uh, decided in, in our most uh, advanced technology around uh, energy generation uh, to put a plant into Charlotte, North Carolina. Why? Because we have decided globally we would like to have and have this as a global lead factory, what we anticipate to bring together in terms of having customer proximity, so we strongly believe in the energy agenda of the United States. Uh, you need to have very high skilled labor force, so we are building up 1,000 direct employees uh, and 2,000 indirect uh, employees. We have a st strong network with the local engineering colleges. And the third element is that you tie together manufacturing to, uh, together with research and development on one side so that you have a very fast translational research activity as you continue to build the competitiveness of your product lines. And all of it uh, has clearly decided based on these three major factors. Now, what you need in addition is <coughs> government consistency. You need consistency of policy. I mean, if you have a tax credit for renewables, which lasts for two years, and you have to make a, an investment decision, for example, which, which you have to look out for 10, 15 years ahead of it. So you have to anticipate a, a certain scenario where you say that that's important for, for these people. And now the American people are now hosting the most advanced power generation capacity, not just for American clients, but also for clients in Latin America, in Asia, in the Middle East. And we will have a third of the product lines just built and uh, produced in these manufacturing sites, exporting out of the United States. And the Exim support that we are getting is a great, a, great, a great example of it. For example, just the last order, what we have done together to, to South Korea, is creating 700 jobs of American people on American soil successfully exporting to South Korea. And I think that's the opportunity, what exists here. And this goes back to education, to high-skilled labor force, to really have this, this local cluster network environment that you feel comfortable and you have consistency of government policy, which you have to anticipate. I think there's something else just under the surface here that, that needs to be talked about, and that is that in today, business, and especially big business, I think primarily in developed countries, doesn't have a very good reputation for lots of reasons. But you go to developing countries, as we do, yeah. China, India, they love business. 
And there's an education thing, I think, here for yeah. all of us in the developed world, certainly in America, about the importance of business to our economy. And it comes back to the screen here with competitiveness. We can't expect America to employ more people by bashing our business and hurting our business in many ways, while our competitors are just the opposite. Yeah. And I worry a lot about that. We spend a lot of time talking to our employees at Caterpillar about the opportunity of developing countries, not the threat. It's a, it's a double-edged sword, but if we don't look at that as an opportunity and figure out how to compete and win, we're going to lose. And that applies to government policies across the board. We just, we just can't suffer that for, for very long, or we will be in last place. Well, let's, let's in fact, Mike, if I could build on Doug's point, because uh, this is one of my pet hobby horses also, because I, I would agree. The, um, if you take a look at the American story, the 200 or so year American story, business of the good guys, it doesn't mean that everything we do is good, just like nothing, not everything Congress does is good. If you're dealing with people, not everything we do is good. But by and large, we're the good guys in this story. The reason that we have a strong military, the reason that we have the uh, kind of economy that we do today, the reason that we're still by far the number one economy in the world, is driven by the success of our businesses. And when I go to China or India, to Doug's point, or any other uh, country, it's unbelievable how they recognize the significance of business in that story. I think that's one of the things that we've managed to lose sight of oftentimes in the US. And if we're going to drive that competitiveness agenda that uh, I was talking about at the beginning, I think it starts with the realization that business yeah. are the good guys in the American story. Well, let's, uh, let, me, let me build on something that, that Doug said and that some of you have mentioned with regard to, to China. Uh, we're not the only model out there, uh, clearly. You've got a major competitor uh, who doesn't have just a lower cost of labor, but his state-owned enterprises that are operating under a certain set of rules, uh, subsidized credit, subsidized land, um, policies that, uh, to, to put it mildly, encourage the transfer of technology for those who want to participate in that market. How do you compete with uh, such a different model around the world? Well, China is just the latest manifestation of this, in my opinion. We, we saw in our business 15 years ago the Koreans enter. We saw 35 years ago the Japanese enter. And remember in the 70s and 80s, the Japanese bought Hawaii and they bought most of California and they, the, the uh, summer palace in Tokyo was worth more than the state of California. My God, they're going to own the whole world. Well, it never happened. And it won't happen for China either. But these transitions, not unlike America's transition away from Britain 200 years ago, et cetera, et cetera. How we deal with this is going to be the secret. China's, China's tough to compete with, but we better learn how to do it. In our case, we've been allowed in. Construction equipment was one of the first industries the Chinese deregulated entirely. We face virtually no investment restrictions today. We own virtually all of our investments 100% in China. We're encouraged and we were just there a week ago, encouraged by all levels of government to continue investing. We don't see a lot of that, for good or for bad, that, that others do. Having said that, we keep all of our intellectual property rights very closely guarded in, in uh, wholly owned and wholly manned uh, areas somewhere in the world, and we're very careful with that. We work with that. The other thing is we've got to push government to government on a level playing field. The WTO rules are good. But it's beyond that. We have just got to keep hammering away. We've got to hammer away on the currency issue. We've got to hammer away on a lot of social issues. And we can do that and should. But at the same time, we can't erect walls around our country that keeps them out of here, which keeps us out of there. And I worry greatly about that, that some, some Chinese company wants to come over and buy an American company, and the US government says no. Well. The next week, one of the three of us is over there trying to do something, and they say no, and it hurts American workers. So somehow we're going to have to figure out this balance with them and work towards a level playing field. We've done it for 200 years with emerging competitors from everywhere. We'll, we've got to work through this one. But it takes, it takes a view of competition that I'm not sure we have figured out mm -hmm. yet across, across our government. David? I think when it uh, comes to China, we tend to want to always make it like a black or white discussion. So you run into the question of, uh, are they a competitor? Are they a partner? Are they a customer? Are they a supplier? The answer, of course, is yes, across the board. 
It requires a more nuanced, thoughtful process. It's not a question of are they good or are they evil. It's more a question of they exist, they're going to continue to exist, and they're probably going to continue to do better. And I was struck by uh, Doug's comment on the Japanese 20 years ago, because I can remember being a, a little shaver in business at the time and yeah, reading yeah. how they had just bought Rockefeller Center and the outcry that went up across uh, the U.S. everywhere about what did that mean in terms of uh, America and how could, they, how could we sell assets like that. And I can remember even then reading it and wondering, I don't quite get the issue. What, what are the Japanese going to do with it? Take it back to Tokyo? <laughs> it, nothing. Now you look at it and say, we have the cash and the land. That sounded pretty good to me. And, but somehow those fears still exist. We just transfer them to another country. And I agree with Doug. I think we should encourage China being able to buy assets in the US. If for no other reason, I like having voices in Beijing saying, hey, hey, what are you doing? I have a lot of money over there. Let's be a little more thoughtful about whatever it is you're thinking about. So I fully support it. When it comes to doing business in China, uh, we're in the same kind of situation. It's almost everything we do is for local domestic consumption. It's grown extremely well. We've grown from about 1,000 employees to about 11,000 employees in China today. And it's all driven by that domestic market. They just keep going. Uh, I hope they do. Nothing is ever eternal. So we could, there, something will happen in there somewhere. There will be another crisis, hopefully no time soon. The two we have are enough right now. But at some point, there will be something that happens. And we have to hope that their system can work their way through that. Peter, uh, let me ask you to comment on that. But let me also pull you back to the German question. Because as I understand it, uh, Germany exports about as much to China from Germany as the U.S. does, and obviously but from a much smaller economy. And unlike uh, the, the model that Doug laid out where you move your manufacturing to China to serve the China market, Germany is servicing the, the China market both from within and from, from Germany. And so I guess my question to you is how do you compete and how do you do it from Germany? Yeah, uh, first of all, I mean, uh, Siemens is in China since 1872. We have 43,000 people. We have $10 billion in sales. We have uh, close to 100 joint ventures. Uh, so there's a, a very, I mean, it goes back to the same issue. You have to have uh, customer proximity. You have to understand very well the market uh, environment. And as we are operating in the United States, that American Siemens employees are, are serving the US market, but also use it as an export platform, uh, we have the same principle and policy in China, where you say that we are uh, we're building the business for China in China, but we're also building the business uh, for China in the world. So, yes, indeed, we have very successful, and I think this is where the intelligence lies. You have to create, as a global company, very intelligent networks of research and development centers. For example, currently the policy in China is very much shifting towards an innovation-driven policy. So we have put 13 research and development centers into China. We have now more than 3,000 Chinese researchers researching in China and linking them into a global network equally as we do it with the United States. So the intelligence of your network, what you call open innovation in terms of research and development, in terms of supply chain, in terms of manufacturing centers of competence, and there you get the synergies so that you don't just end up with a model where you say, well, I want to export. Uh, yes, indeed, you can export if, if you have the capacity and intelligence to also add to it local content, local requirements. Uh, and that's the, the networked global economy, which is now working. And it goes back to innovation leadership. You only can do it if you, have, if you are the innovation leader in your space. Then you have a play. If you are forcefully focusing on productivity, then it doesn't matter what the underlying labor costs are because your productivity is all right. Uh, and that's the type of model which, uh, which works very well for our company. And I think that's the type of model which, uh, which Doc and Dave were also emphasizing, which is very important, what we have to do here and everywhere else in the world. Well, I've been holding back from asking this question uh, because I, I know we're open a can of worms. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, Dave, I, I, reading between the lines, I, I, I think you believe we ought to have lower corporate taxes. Is that right? <laughs> um, I don't know if I mentioned zero. <laughs> did you mention zero? Did I mention that? Uh, I figured that would get uh, everybody thinking. Uh, on the off chance that doesn't get done, um, uh, I'll ask each of you what you think the, the top three or four things 
uh, the U.S. government ought to be doing, yeah. doing better, doing differently to facilitate uh, competitiveness here, exports here, uh, economic growth. Yeah, so, yeah I, I look at this as kind of short-term, long-term. Short-term, we have got to get this debt situation and fiscal balance under control. Yep. You've been intimately involved mm -hmm. with this. This is inexcusable. There's, there, we are, it's out of control and has to be brought. It's amazing to me this morning in the news We've agreed that it's going to be a $23 billion cut on a trillion, billion, whatever it is, budget. you got to be kidding me. We can do this in our sleep because we face this every single day with expense control. But it just isn't happening, and we need leadership so desperately, first and foremost, short-term thing. Uh, the, the second thing, I think, is a, is a bit longer, and that would be around this, this entire education of our people. Uh, under the fiscal piece, I'd put health care, I'd put pension reform, I'd put a lot of things, but it's really under that fiscal piece, and Dave knows that better than any of us, but long term, if, if we don't crank out engineers, if we don't crank out the types of people we need to compete around the world, we will be forced to go around the world to get those people. And long term, that's not a good thing. This country is educated. We put the man on the moon in this country in a one-room schoolhouse, and yet we spend more money than ever, and we seem to get behind her by the year in education. Something is fundamentally wrong. I'm no expert, but I know something's wrong. There's a lot of experts that can figure this out and that have recommendations. So I put broadly those two categories. Uh, short term, just this entire fiscal situation that is undermining our reputation, our ability to lead the world, uh, our military might, our economic might, the whole thing short term that's uh, right around our neck. And long term, if we don't get education, our people uh, uh, brought worldwide standards were in trouble. I, I'd answer quickly like that. We can go, that's a big question yeah. and a good one. Dave? Other, uh, than, other than corporate taxes at zero, what would you suggest? <laughs> I may have to send you a note on that one outlining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd go back to my comments right at the beginning. I think there's three big things that we need to address. Debt, energy policy, and education. And the debt, just to put it into perspective, the seeds of the next U.S. recession have already been planted. And it's in that debt. The debt will grow from $9 trillion today to about $20 trillion 10 years from now, even assuming 4.5% nominal GDP growth per year for 10 years. And it's all because the baby boomer generation retires, and we've committed more in benefits than we can pay, given the number of people that we'll be paying in. Our interest bill alone in 2021 will be about a $1 trillion a year. Now, to put that in perspective, because all of us deal with millions, we deal with billions, trillions just seems like the next number in line. If you had spent a million dollars a day since Jesus Christ was born 2,010 years ago, you would still not have spent a trillion dollars. That will be our annual interest bill. Now, some people say, okay, well, we'll work our way through. And you say, okay, this will end. But it can end one of two ways. We can do it now, thoughtfully and proactively, or we can wait for the bond market to force us to do it. And you see what happens in Portugal and Spain and other places as uh, Greece, as that starts to happen. Tough to relate to the bond market sometimes. So here's the way to think about it. The 10-year bond goes to 9%. Home loans then go to 13%. Auto loans go to 17%. What does that do to your economy? What happens to competitiveness? Everything falls apart because we weren't willing to face into the issues that we have today, and we preferred to wait for the crisis. There's a lot of discussion going on now, but we need to do something. Energy policy, the second one, and it needs to focus on both energy efficiency and energy generation. Energy generation is more of a technology issue, and I would say there you've got to stay technology neutral, let a thousand flowers bloom, and to Peter's point, you can't, if you're going to subsidize something, put a long enough time frame on it so that people can actually act. Don't end up just continuing to do something every two years, but at some point it should end. You can't keep it going. On the efficiency side, it's more of a behavior and incentives point. If you just used existing Honeywell products and technologies, you could save 20 to 25 percent of the U.S. energy bill. Same thing in Europe. And I've had this validated. I recognize I'm in a society where if the CEO's talking, people assume he's lying. I had this validated through DOE data, lawyers, consultants, others. But it leads you to the question of, so how come nobody's doing it? 
Why is that happening? And you start to look at how the incentives work in the system, whether it's utilities, how companies invest, and it doesn't make any sense. We're not set up to get the result that we want to have. And on education, uh, we talked about this before, and I completely support uh, uh, Doug and Peter's comments on this. We need more engineers, and we need to think about everything that helps generate engineers, whether it's our education system, our immigration policy. We need engineers. Peter? Well, I would say, I'm, as, a, as a father of two American children, uh, never lose the American spirit. And I think when you talk to the young people, I, I think this is what this country is really, this is the fabric this country is built on. Everything is possible. And uh, as Dave says, when you talk to college kids and, uh, and children at, at the university level, inspire them that the engineering yeah. uh, is really the place to be. And that's about it. And continue to implement the policy what President Obama is actually putting forward. And I, I could just echo the comments what my two speakers have done. Good. Well, let me just turn to the rest of the world for the last part of this discussion. Uh, uh, this is more than you bargained for, isn't it? I'm, I'm, take, I'm taking notes, as always. Uh, uh, you take them back to the uh, administration absolutely. if you would. Uh, uh, where do you see the biggest opportunities around the world? And I know, Dave, you and I work a lot on, on India together. And, and be honest about where you see the challenges as well in some of those markets. And then uh, you mentioned in passing what was going on in Spain and Portugal. What do you see as the biggest, biggest risks to the global economy mm -hmm. that you're worried about uh, and that you're holding back uh, because of? Doug? Well, the, the biggest opportunities in, in our business at Caterpillar are, are easy. It's infrastructure built around the world. That's happening in China, India, Brazil, and a whole list of countries that suddenly we find almost 7 billion people want to live like Americans. When I joined business in 1975, China was closed, Russia was closed, India was basically closed, Vietnam was closed, and on and on and on and on. All those countries are now open. And they're open for business, they're open for expansion, they're open for progress. And I am very, very fortunate to lead a company that supplies a big piece of that. So there's no question that that ball, that snowball is going downhill in those countries, and that's where the, the big, fast growth opportunities are going to be. Having said that, Think about the crumbling infrastructure, in our case, in the United States and to some degree Western Europe. It's everywhere. We are so fortunate at Caterpillar to have this. It's just to have this opportunity. It just depends now on how these countries and economies address this. And, and the, the China five-year planning process, in fact, Peter and I were just over there going through this to some degree. They put a vision out there at the end, five years, and, and everybody in the country goes after it. That's a wonderful model. We do that in business. It's the same at Caterpillar. There's probably a lesson there for the U.S. government and other governments as well. What are the biggest risks around the world today, short term? Absolutely energy price. We are on the ragged edge of, of, of oil prices teetering the world economy again. We know it collapsed it at 140. Will it do it at 110 to 115? So far, so good but we're on that ragged edge. So the Middle East right now, short term, is a flashpoint that needs to be watched and it's getting the, the due attention. Another one that I worry about that's more corrosive is, is just this wave of protectionism that we all are seeing. That suddenly we want to make a big investment in China and they say, no, you can't do it. China wants to make a big investment here. They say, no, you can't do it. And the walls go up. Our exports stop from only a country with 5% of the world's consumers and we watch our business yep. deteriorate over a 10-year period, and it can happen rapidly. So I, I'd put those, there's a whole list, but those I, I would think would be one very short term that I think we'll get through pretty well. And the second one I worry about every day, and it gets back to business bashing and, and high unemployment in this country persisting so long that, 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 that draws friction on trade and, 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 uh, and dealing with friends and enemies, and it, I, I worry about that one a lot. Dave? I uh, agree with all of Doug's comments, would add on the infrastructure side. Uh, I agree. I think we're going to see a, a boom in infrastructure spending over the next 20, 25 years because of a, a double effect. The emerging markets, like, uh, in fact, maybe we shouldn't call them emerging anymore, but call them high growth markets. When you look at places like India and China, 
Uh, they're investing about 9% of GDP in infrastructure, and that's probably going to go on for a while. Europe invests about 5%. The U.S., over the last 10 years or so, has been investing around 2%, 2% of GDP. Uh, it is crumbling. I agree, I agree with that. You just have to drive I-95, and you can say, this is not pleasant, and realize you, you, we're going to have to do something. When you look at the U.S. having to catch up, and when you look at the emerging markets continuing to spend at that rate, uh, I think infrastructure is going to continue to be good. Completely agree on oil prices also. That has to be uh, uh, a concern. I would also add debt across the world, because while yeah, I'm concerned good. about public debt in the U.S., uh, government debt is even worse in a place like Europe. Uh, the thing that's different is that our consumer debt is significantly worse than Europe. When you just add debt to debt and just do the comparison, there is an incredible amount of debt that we have to work our, work our way through. And that's the other part that I think can sink us. In terms of where do I look at for growth markets, any place where government views itself as an enabler of business, not of unfettered cowboy capitalism with no regulation, but rather where they view themselves as an enabler of business, that they recognize they don't create jobs, but they create an environment where jobs can be created. And if you look at a place like China, that's how they view it. India increasingly looking at it that way. And to the extent that governments shift towards that direction, that's a very good place to be. It's a good place for business, and it's a very good place for its citizens. Peter? I totally agree with uh, what Doug and Dave just said. I think when you, when you look ahead, and uh, by 2050, we will have 3 billion more people on this planet. So urban infrastructure development programs will be a huge, a huge growth area. And if I have one wish to the U.S. administration, spearhead access and the free trade agenda for the world because I think that's the big, big opportunity. What is ahead of us, it is demonstrated that free trade is really helping to grow the global economy. And I think this is a key enabler for us as we operate in a global environment. Could I, could I add to that, Mike? Because both Doug and Peter mentioned it, and I think it bears reinforcing. Uh, but the whole importance of free trade, there's a tendency, it seems, to look at economics as a zero-sum game. Uh, their gain is my loss. And economics doesn't work that way. It's on a micro basis. If you go to the store and spend 10 bucks to buy something, you're both happy. The merchant's happy because he's got the 10 bucks. You're happy because you got the merchandise. For some reason, that simple concept gets lost very much at a macro level. And instead, there's always a feeling that somebody's getting away with something. Somebody's eating your lunch, and it's unfair. As opposed to figuring out how to compete and recognizing that creative uh, destruction and the focus on a growing economy, the interaction of an economy, is good for everybody. Everybody benefits. Standard of living rises for everyone. I testified yesterday in front of Ways and Means on on all three free trade agreements currently pending, Colombia, Panama, and South Korea. In the four and a half years we've been watching this, my customers in Colombia have paid three and a half billion dollars in taxes to Colombia based on the tariffs they impose on our products coming into Colombia. We impose none on Colombia products coming in here today. This is an easy win for yeah, us. Exactly. And we will see where we have trade agreements in, pra in place in Latin America, we see trade surpluses. Where we don't, we see trade deficits. This is the, a, a micro caterpillar equation now. So this is something that is, it's a hard sell right now with unemployment where it is, but you've got to talk yeah. about growing the pie because the pie gets bigger every time we've seen that. But it's a hard sell in this area where business is bad and you've got to, you can't do business because they're going to take your money away from you. We've got to get over that and get through that and get on to business. And the pie gets bigger here too when you do yeah, that. Yeah. All right, last question. It's a two-part question. Uh, Your two-part questions are complicated. <laughs> if, you were, uh, Mike's complicated. if you were back here in uh, 2015 at the Exim conference in 2015, uh, will we have doubled exports by that time or not? And secondly, what will be the, the trend, the fact, the development that we're not, it's not even on our radar screen right now that you think might be on our radar screen on five years that will have a big impact on your business? You know, Peter mentioned three billion more people in the world in, hmm. in, a, in, a, in a few decades. What's the, the big new factor that's going to affect American business? Doug. 
Yeah, well, the, the first question is, I hope we double exports, and I share the goal, and we're working hard to make it happen, and I know XM Bank and others are really getting after it. The answer to that is going to depend an awful lot on things out of our control. Economic growth in, in, in high growth countries, our attitude here about business, are we going to continue to not be competitive or as competitive as we should be around the world in how we treat each other in, between government and business? Uh, if we double exports, we're all gonna, we're all gonna love it. The pie will have grown significantly. So I, I really share that. Um, what was the second question? Big trend, big new big development. Big new development. Not on yeah. our radar screen right I, now. I really think crystal going, ball. Yeah, yeah. I really think it's going to be around energy price, energy costs, energy opportunity. Uh, climate change may be a piece of that. It may not. But with seven billion people consuming energy, the price is going up, and it's going to drive tremendous problems and tremendous opportunities. And I, for one, am excited to see it happen because there's going to be a creative destruction, as Dave mentioned, as we go through this. And I think that's really going to offer a lot of opportunities painfully. Dave? Uh, I would say in terms of figuring out uh, with, whether we'll double exports, I'm kind of with Doug on that one, is I think it depends. And if we just, if we say, okay, we want to do it, but we don't want to do free trade, we don't want to address our yeah. debt, we don't want to address our energy policy, yeah, you know, we don't really want to go to school and do the tough stuff, I think it's a little tougher to double exports. It's not just going to happen. There has to be a whole, um, there has to be a, something really behind it that changes fundamentally the, uh, the country. When it comes to the kind of what's the unknown that could whack us, I'd say over the next uh, four or five years, we really need to evolve our relationship with China. And that includes what do, how do we think about ourselves domestically, how do we compete, and how do we interact with them. And that's going to be a big one that we have to constantly be thinking about and constantly be working, because it's not going to be one of these where we set the path today and we just follow that for 10 years and that's the way it's going to work. There's going to be constant adjustment and work going on here. And I liken it oftentimes to what happened 100, 150 years ago as you looked at how the UK and the US relationship evolved. And I think we have to be pretty thoughtful about how do we want to work this and be working it on a daily, monthly, annual basis to make sure that evolves in the right direction. A, uh, our, a rich, strong China I think is good for the world. You end up with better standard of living everywhere. We had a model where only a billion people in the world were thinking about how to make the world a better place. Now you have three billion people doing that, maybe four. The more people you have thinking about innovation, about how do you make things better, it benefits the entire world. So if we can pull this off, that, that's a big one to do over the next five years. Peter? Well, I, I don't know I don't want to speculate, but I can only say Siemens will play its part to really make sure that the doubling of the export out of the United <laughs> States is happening. Uh, but what, is, uh, what are the major tra uh, trends what I see? I think what is, what is really now more apparent than ever, Mike, you, have, uh, you are part of the change of the political landscape. I mean, let's, I mean, before the crisis we were talking about G7, G8, now we're talking about G20. I think we are we are really entering a truly multipolar world and a world which is far more connected. And we're just living through what is happening through social media and the impact what it has actually on the political movements which we are now seeing. So the global consumer, I see this whole connectivity of the consumer and the world and of people around the world. Uh, a massive trend towards acceleration of, of innovation competitiveness, uh, political decision-making, interconnectivity, so a, a fair and global access. And we as companies and as leaders are able to leverage the entrepreneurial spirit with our companies around the world to the benefit. This is the big, big unleashing of the incremental growth opportunity. Well, I'll try not to uh, abuse my position as moderator to to comment or answer uh, all, all the previous comments, only to say the following. I take great comfort from this conversation because I think a number of the issues that have been cited, whether it's uh, dealing with the medium-term uh, fiscal 
sustainability issue, dealing with education reform and science, technology, and education and engineering um, uh, uh, efforts, uh, working through the remaining issues on Colombia and Panama so that we can get yeah. the free trade agreements uh, passed, uh, or addressing energy. And I'll draw your attention to the president's speech of yesterday on energy policy that talked about both production and consumption mm -hmm. issues, nuclear, gas, oil, as well as efficiency. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done, but I think the agenda that you all have laid out is an agenda that's certainly shared by the President and his administration, and look forward to, to working with you to, uh, to, to execute on that. These are three of the most thoughtful CEOs in the entire world. It's a privilege to have them here, and thank you very much for participating. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. You might have a future in